ಕಾಲಾವಸ್ಕಾಂಪ್ಲೆಕ್ಸ್ which is actually based on a proposed national park that is yet to be gazetted but there is also a little bit of history behind that national park and that general area as well so that will be our three areas of focus today yeah and like you did mention the predominant factor will be that this is the more in elephant driven zone and elephant protection driven zone and it is known for its population of sri lankan elephants absolutely so so shall we start with waskamo and then move upwards that way yeah, yeah. so waskamo national park has an interesting history you see it actually started out as one of four strict nature reserves on the island but unfortunately waskamo wasn't one of the ones that was looked after as well as it should have been and due to a lot of political interference and general socio economic factors Waskamo National Park only ended up becoming a national park in 1984 due to the fact that the strict nature of the original 460 square kilometers lost about 40 to 50 square kilometers over a period of about 50 years and it was after that that the DWC decided time to turn Waskamo into a national park that actually makes money for surrounding communities and it's an amazing national park which I'm sure you can attest to very well definitely and it's very different to other national parks just its location and everything gives it a difference and when you go through waskamo you actually wonder sometimes but they are still in sri lanka in some of the places exactly so and one of the things that it is definitely that, one to visit absolutely and one of the things that i think is important to stress for a lot of people is that waskamo national park doesn't have the best track record when it comes to management as far as administrative management is concerned it's actually fairly poor in waskamo but it's certainly an area to look at definitely getting something done because it's so isolated so wild and has such a high density of sloth bears the economic potential for that national park is through the roof i would say all right so when you come to waskam again and we can show this better on the map yeah so that is really what waskam would be and then when you do go up yeah. here this is where mahavali flood plains comes into the picture and just up here is the other national park which is angamad so do you want to talk about the importance of these two to waskam as a whole and to the connection towards the east yeah so as you can see on the map there angamadilla and mahavali flood plains actually help waskamo connect to a number of other protected areas in that immediate vicinity particularly mahavali flood plains mahavali flood plains actually acts as a quote unquote national park corridor which allows the facilitation of ecological movement between waskamo mahavali through mahavali flood plains and onto somawati and the rest of the mahavali region so that would be sri lanka's eastern terrestrial protected areas which is another huge chunk and even between waskamo which is 393 square kilometers then you have angamadilla which is 75 square kilometers and mahavali flood plains which is another 174 square kilometers we're looking at quite a significant expanse of wild area you know proper wilderness area but of course even mahavali flood plains has suffered quite considerably over the years um so it's it's a mixed picture i would say and i think you can also yes. probably elaborate on that definitely and that is where i think talking about these national parks that are here and that are probably less known compared to probably waskamo and minnery and kaudul angamadil and mahavali flood plains is probably less known amongst everyone and even Definitely. the nature lovers and environmentalists and they're not talked about enough and as we know there is a lot of encroachment and other illegal activities happening within mahavali flood plains as well as angamadil because of this factor yeah and i think the big one to touch on just for everybody who isn't aware there is an enormous sand mining industry taking place within the boundaries of mahavali flood plains national park now the brief history behind that is um there was actually a supreme court decision which the dwc went to court regarding mahavali flood plains which they lost 
that unfortunately allowed the Geological Survey and Mines Bureau to actually quasi-legalize or semi-legalize the extraction of sand from Mahabali Floodplains National Park. So we've actually calculated, roughly speaking, 6 billion rupees a year worth of sand is extracted from Mahabali Floodplains National Park every year. That's a lot of money for sand. It's, it's considerable. And that is where that connection of the A11 that goes across uh, Mahabali and Waskamo really comes into effect because that is where, from there, everything filters into Mahabali Floodplains. Absolutely. And even from, um, I mean, even from Anga Medilla's perspective, Anga Medilla is one of those little known national parks that, again, doesn't see too much in terms of visitation. I think in 2018, if I remember the statistics correctly, five visitors from abroad and maybe 200 locals visited Anga Medilla in an entire year. So it's very little known, but it's about 75 square kilometers, as I said. So it's about a uh, Minaria National Park size. And it has significant potential for elephants and sloth bear. So it's definitely not one to be counted out. Yeah, definitely. And then that's where Anga Madila also becomes important because it also creates that connection towards Mineria and Kaudula. And yeah. that is where, as the well-known gathering, which is one of the wonders of nature, I would say. In Asia, it is probably up there in the top, the gathering where you can see hundreds of elephants together in Mineria and Kaudula during the dry season. So do you want to touch on the importance of Anga Medilla for that as well, for the movement and other protected areas in these areas? Can Absolutely. Waskamo and all that. So as at least some of you would be aware, the great elephant gathering of Asia that takes place in Mineria and Kaudla National Parks, a lot of the elephants that actually come to Mineria and Kaudla during this period are actually relative migrants. They're not residents from the general area. So one of the reasons why Anga Medilla is so important from a connectivity perspective is that it actually allows elephants to directly come from Boscamo, of which there are significant herds of elephants in Boscamo National Park, through Anga Medilla and straight into Minneria. And once they cross over into Minneria, they stay there for the months of the gathering between July and September. And then when the gathering ceases to happen, then they come back to Boscamo via Anga Medilla. So that connectivity is a key area of importance when it comes to wild elephant conservation. And I think that is where we can also touch on the fact of the human elephant conflict coming into effect, because this migration that you were talking about happens yeah. through these areas. And due to bad land management and bad planning, probably that's where the human elephant conflict happens because of these animals moving through populated areas now. And as we know, there's the A11 and I think A9 that goes up towards Trinco. Yeah. That comes into effect and along these two roads, there's a lot of human population. So that is where the human elephant conflict really starts because of the migration happening here and all the elephants in this area. Yeah. And if I may add on to that as well, uh, there are two protected areas that are adjacent to Vasgama and just south of Minera National Park. One is the Minera Giritle Nature Reserve, blocks one to four. And then you have the Alahara Giritle Wildlife Sanctuary. And one thing I will say as far as destruction is concerned, over the past four years, we have seen considerable encroachments, especially from an agricultural perspective, into these protected areas. And as we were talking about earlier, that has exacerbated the human elephant conflict to very high levels. So that is also something that will need to be addressed at some point when we can get yes, it. Definitely. And the other thing is that I would want to touch on is the way it's portrayed in probably news and all is probably also a yep. bit negative. And that's where we need to bring in the education. Because it's talked about as these elephants are going into these farmers' agricultural areas and then raiding crops and they're known as crop raiders and all of that. But what really is happening is these people are moving in and encroaching along the protected areas. And animals being animals, they go looking for food. And when they see this lovely food grown for them, they think, they have no other option but to go in and eat and then that's where the conflict does arise. Yeah, and it's, it's common sense, you know. If you have herds of wild elephants traversing these protected areas that you see no economic value in, and then you decide you want to grab some of that land for an agricultural venture of some kind, especially if it's growing vegetables or fruits, you should expect that wild elephants are going to come and start raiding your crops because, number one, you've cleared their food sources. Number two, you've encroached directly into their habitat, what little of it remains. And number three, they're hungry. Elephants need you know, up to 150 kilos, if not more, food a day. So how do you satisfy the hunger desire of such a big animal? They will raid your crops. And that is 
you know, the other side of the human elephant conflict that nobody talks about. It's a shame, but it needs more awareness, in my opinion. Yeah, and the human elephant conflict is one that can be talked about for a long, long time. Yeah. And it is one that is very prevalent in this area. That's why we have included it and spoken about it. There are lots of things being done and there are lots of groups that talk about it and the way to mitigate it. And again, it comes down to the fact of how probably our land use and our planning comes into effect and the implementation of those plans. Yeah, because land use is something that we have never been brilliant at from a policy standpoint. And that's something that, ne that needs to change significantly. Because if I can draw people's attention to, if you show them on the map, the Kalababa forest complex, the biggest protected area in that forest complex is the Kahalapallekele Wildlife Sanctuary. Kahalapallekele has been a wildlife sanctuary since 1989. And yet for some reason, if you look at it on the satellite imagery, and I would recommend that people actually have a look at this, in the middle of it, you can see there is significant encroachment to the point where the wildlife sanctuary actually surrounds settlements, uh, which are almost turning into towns now. There's electricity lines, railway lines, concrete roads, and all of that has really exacerbated the human elephant conflict in that general area. And then if we move on from there to one that people will certainly be interested in, which is Kalavaba, the proposed national park that was never actually gazetted and still remains in proposed status and is now unfortunately closed due to the aforementioned human elephant conflict, there definitely needs to be more of a policy of pursuance of gazetting protected areas, because without gazetting these protected areas, people will continue to encroach. And at least when you have them gazetted, you have a legal means by which to fight against them. If they remain proposed, then you have no chance whatsoever. And that's where sometimes you wonder where the planning comes in and how to push these gazettes through. So the proposal does go into a gazette form and it is gazetted as a national park because that is Absolutely. very important because it gives that extra big protection for these national parks. What would be your thoughts on the proposed Kalawewa National Park and its importance? Because as you look, it's that isolated block and yeah. that Kalawewa is Kalawewa and Balaluwewa in that area. Yeah. If you can get that gazetted, that is a big chunk of that. So for me personally, now for those who have tuned in, I'm sure you'll have seen my Instagram handle is Tusker Tracking with John. And for me, always one of the things, aside from sloth bears, that has been one of my key areas of focus when it comes to terrestrial big five is Tuskers. And let me tell you something. The proposed Kalavava National Park and historically that Kahalapalakali Wildlife Sanctuary area has been a haven for Tuskers. You know, we can look at all the big names, such as Digadanta, the original. Then you have Digadanta 1, Digadanta 2, Ravatha, some of the younger ones, such as Asala 1, Asala 2. There is almost 30 recorded Tuskers and a number of unnamed Tuskers who are still quite small, a new generation of Tuskers who live in that small area. And the proposed square kilometrage for Kalawaba National Park is only 50 square kilometers. It makes it one of our smaller national parks. So from that perspective, I think that Kalawaba is the most ecological hotspot, at least from an important standpoint, where Tuskers are concerned. There is no other place in the country where in such a small area you get such a high density of Tuskers. It's fantastic. And I'm sure you can attest to that from your experiences yeah, there. Definitely. And Kalawa is one of those places for real nature lovers who go looking for Tuskers as yourself. That is a hotspot as such. For yeah. these Tusker photographers and all of that. And it is, again, because of that isolation factor, I think, because those animals have nowhere to move. Yeah. And I reckon they can't go and meet other herds, which happens on just a little further east of them. Yeah. So that is the other sad fact, that there's so much development that has happened that has made them into a little island in the middle, in the north central province. So that is where even this island has so much to offer that island, meaning not Sri Lanka as a whole, the island of the Kalawewa protected area zone, that yeah. we need to push this gazette through for Kalawewa to be turned into a national park. And by and that definition, yeah, yeah and, and by that definition, it would actually create a string of further protected areas that would allow elephants to finally properly migrate from that Kalawewa protected area complex, which we refer to as the forest complex, and that north central elephant protection zone. Because even now, I can tell you with a certain degree of accuracy that one of the routes that these wild elephants are taking, the ones who do risk migrating back and forth, is via the reticular strict nature reserve. Because the reticular strict nature reserve sits almost as an outcrop 
in the middle of that landscape. And it allows elephants to have a brief stopover before they carry on to Minneri and Kaubla. But there's a problem, you see, because there is a proposed reserve under the Department of Forest Conservation, also called Ritigala, which was meant to act as a protected area buffer zone, but that was never gathered either. So last year, I believe, there was another 400 to 500 acres in that proposed reserve that was just wiped off the face of the earth. And that is going to further contribute to the human elephant conflict that we're talking about. So we need to have a policy that is inclusive of all these protected areas, focusing on connectivity and making sure that we actually know that these wild elephants can traverse safely without making the human elephant conflict worse. The key thing I would have picked up from what you were just talking about for any of the listeners is the fact that they had a risk at the moment. Yeah. It's a risk. So moving from Kalawewa and that area towards the east has become a risk, mainly because if you do look at the map, I'll bring the map up for this. These two roads, that's the A9 and the A6, and then the A11 starts from somewhere there. Yeah. So that, those two big roads, and then there's a lot of settlements in between. So that is what's happening. And you really don't see too much green here, which indicates the protected areas. So that becomes a risk, and that's where the human-elephant conflict can come into effect again because of the fact that it's a risk and these big animals are moving through settlements and roads yeah. and what would you say and on that fact how would I mean, yeah if you so if you go back to the map and just zoom in a little bit to the east of uh Dambula town um that area there all those protected areas that you see just east of Dambula town are department of forest conservation and i remember about a year and a half ago we actually lost eight or nine wild elephants to poisoning i mean the human elephant conflict yeah. has become so rife in that area that here. somebody had gone and said that they had actually been poisoned. Now, there is conflicting evidence to say that they weren't poisoned and they died from something else entirely. But this is an example of how the fragmentation that we talked about earlier is really making the human-elephant conflict get worse and worse year on year. So those points need to be addressed. And that, again, comes down to bringing the two departments, wildlife conservation and forest conservation, together to actually work on a proper management plan by which wild elephants can be preserved if you, you know, get what I mean. Yes, definitely. And we've been talking throughout these live sessions about the need for that togetherness. So yeah. both our departments that are in charge or predominantly in charge of protected areas across Sri Lanka coming together and creating a good plan because in the end it is for that conservation factor. And we've been saying this throughout. And as we move, that's what that's the thing we see across the island is the fact that there has to be proper planning, proper implementation, and we've been talking about policies coming up. And the policies have been good, but it's that implementation factor. So just finding a way of better implementation and educating our people on these protected areas and creating that awareness. Yeah. And then if there's one more area that I would definitely draw people's attention to, even from a visitation standpoint, it would be Hurulu. So yes. if you show them on the map, the Hurulu area, uh, so Hurulu is an interesting one because the entire area that you see, uh, if you zoom in and move slightly up, that area is known as the Hurulu Conservation Forest. It's actually an existing protected area. But in 2007, 2008, in that period, the Department of Forest Conservation actually opened an ecological or eco park in the southern boundary of that uh, Hurulu Conservation Forest. Now, that is interesting because that provides people with an idea by which they can go on safari in a Department of Forest Conservation protected area, similar to how they would in Mineria and Kaudusa, yet at the same time, they're exploring a very different environment. It's slightly more modified. There's a lot more teak plantations inside due to historical, um, historical decisions, but at the same time, there's still exactly the same amount of wildlife that you would find in Mineria and Kaudula. And this Hurulu Ecological Park has become quite important, even from the DFC, because if I remember correctly, in 2018, the DFC, from the few protected areas that they're open, uh, made 71 million rupees, and at least 30% of that came from the Hurulu Ecological Park. It has become one of the biggest DFC uh, safari destinations. In fact, I would say more so than Singaraja. So it's quite because important. Initially, I think Hurulu was also open to try and relax the prejudice on Mineria and Kaudul from the traffic that was going into them. Yeah. And then Hurulu, people started realizing this is also a good place to go and see elephants as well and with less people probably bothering you and the animals. And that, but earlier, now it's not as seen. When you drove on the A9 up towards Trinko, 
you used to see elephants all around that area but now the elephants also have started moving more into the protected area because of the human elephant conflict and them figuring out that they are at very high risk and they have moved into the protected areas but still they're such social animals and they need to move around that massive animal so that is where there is a pretty big issue because they can't be limited to that I meaning even we don't like being limited like we're stuck at home at the moment and we feel what that is like so just imagine an elephant having to be stuck to a protected area or stuck at home for well it becomes long months for them because of the fact of the human elephant conflict and you know whatever said or done elephants are very much migratory animals you know whether their range is localized regionalized or at a national level where they're crossing the entire country elephants do need to keep yeah. moving to eat to survive and to generally you know have a positive existence but if you start confining them to certain areas without allowing them the freedom to move then you are actually causing a debilitation process to them and to the population because once they become unhealthy that has a knock on effect to future generations of elephants so it is important that that connectivity remains and they are allowed to carry on with the movement that they historically did and that is the importance the movement because they are not animals that like to be mitigated or like to be inhibited as such yeah. that's why even the fences create issues for them and that's where you see elephants breaking fences and moving out because of the fact that they're migratory and very social because when you do go to the gathering and please for those who haven't been it's one of the things that you should do absolutely but also remember i think min area has started being really good at this that they don't allow people off the jeep tracks and all of that whereas yeah. earlier you were getting people going right up to the elephants and really causing problems and i must give a shout out to the department of wildlife in min area that they're doing a really good job when i went recently So on that it is a place to visit and it is a really amazing thing to see if you do get a chance. Yeah. And also to add on to that from a connectivity standpoint there is two protected areas that I would like to point out. One is the Sigiri Pitorangla Wildlife Sanctuary which again is one of those wildlife sanctuaries that has suffered considerably over the past few years and then the other one would be the Moragaswa National Reserve Forest again which has also suffered from significant encroachment. Keep in mind that from Kalavaba via Rithigala into the Dambula area without protected areas such as Sigiri Pitorangla and Moragaswaba the wild elephants that come to min area would be reduced in a significant capacity so much like you just gave a shout out to the DWC i would also just like to create an awareness point where dfc protected areas should be more exposed to the general public instead of being kept hidden and that way we can ensure that they have a future to ensure that the gathering itself survives instead of losing you know 20 30% of the elephants that you might lose if they get destroyed and i think that also links back to that point that we've been talking about throughout these sessions is that together and both these departments working together because each one is as important to the other yeah absolutely so anyway so, we're coming to the end of that 30 minutes and if there's yeah. anything more to add because we've done waska moa angan madil and all of that and it's that connection that you see in this area because of the fact that there's so much elephant activity happening in these areas is that connection that is needed because they are animals that move around and need a lot of space yeah and i think even from the i think the final thing i'll touch on before we wrap up is that even in this area there is a lot of cultural and archaeological significance so for example the kandalama kaludia pokuna national reserved forest is actually a joint venture between the dfc and the department of archaeology due to the fact that there are ruins dating back to about 800 to 1000 years ago So aside from the ecological value of these areas there is also significant archaeological and cultural aspects to this as well. Remember that protected Sigiri areas is a great example of that. Absolutely. And remember protected areas aren't just about ecological they do also have an archaeological and cultural aspect historically I'm not saying modern. And that's the and other that's thing now for people who haven't been to Kala but Kala have now been proposed and in that it's in a unknown state and we need to push that proposal through but in that Kala have area even heritage wise there's the aukana and raswera and all of those things mm-hmm. that should be visited and outside protected areas as well the cultural heritage is amazing in these areas especially in this north central province absolutely so i guess we can wrap up on that point uh, yeah. and then for next time we will focus on no, sri lanka on. northern terrestrial protected areas which is quite an interesting area especially with the new national parks that were gathered in i would say lots of people have started 
going in there recently because after the wars yeah. and so in the last 10 years so it's one of those unexplored regions as well so that's why it becomes interesting and just to bring it up on the map before yeah you see do see a lot of greenery up there so it will be predominantly in the area up here because remember that region is historically known as the vanni forest region and it covers three districts basically kilanochi mulatibu and vaunia so there is quite a bit to talk about but uh, i'll leave that till next time just so we don't spoil it and yeah not to spoil anything but that is the first base for most of the migratories as well so we'll be touching on the importance of those and all of that in the next session and i hope most of you will join us for that and yeah, i shall so see you on monday absolutely see you back all right